here on Facebook. So for now, it's just you and me on Zoom, and we'll just go that way. So, okay, good morning, everybody. It's 11 a.m., a little bit after Pacific time, and uh, good morning. Good to see everybody. This is another installment of, I just call it Jeff Carr and his friends on a Bible discussion. I'm not sure what else to call it. And today we have Brent Moody with us. Uh, Brent is in the greater Houston area. That's the best way I'll describe it because there's, I don't know what town you live in, but what town are you in? I live in Spring. Spring, okay. That's north. Good golf course called Tour 18 nearby, which I love to play. So I'll uh, have to come see you and do that again. Brent and I have known each other for a long time, met at the Dry Creek Camp. We're counselors together in the same cabin once or twice. I forget how many years. And then you just took off and said, never again. I'm working with Jeff Carr. But we're still friends, Brent. And uh, we've uh, talked a lot on offline and online and Facebook and email since then. So I appreciate the friendship throughout the years. Hard to believe you got four kids that look just like you and your lovely wife. It's uh, amazing uh, Good to see that. Today's topic is understanding biblical narrative. And so we're going to talk about that today. Not sure if we're going to go to the book of Ruth or the book of Genesis for the story of Joseph. We'll just see how the spirit moves us, Brent, and see where the conversation goes. Uh, let me start off with a word of prayer, and then we'll begin our study here. Uh, Father in heaven, it's good that we can be together today. We thank you for this time. We thank you for the means of the internet to bring all of us together. And uh, we pray for a, an insightful and uh, edifying conversation on understanding the Bible narrative. Uh, please be with us and give us wisdom during this discussion and our study together. We ask you to be with those that are on the front lines dealing with this virus from the service workers that help us and have our daily needs met and then also the healthcare workers who are working feverishly and tirelessly uh, to help eradicate and to deal with this uh, illness that is going around and plaguing so many people. Again, please be with us now and bless our study together. It's in your son's name. Amen. Okay, let me make sure. Yep, we're on record now. Okay, Brent, you and I talked a couple weeks ago about topics when I was trying to recruit you, and we kind of went back and forth, I'm not sure which topic. And so the topic you chose is understanding biblical narrative. And I thought, what in the world are we going? It's been, so I'm curious, why did you choose this? Why is this an important topic to you, Brent? Well, I think um, viewing scripture through a narrative lens is extremely important. I um, mean, it's infrequently done, unfortunately. Um, there's a, a lot of kind of picking and choosing of verses and texts here and there to maybe form um, beliefs. Uh, and, and some of that can be done and, and mistakes will not be made. Um, but I, I think it's much uh, better to kind of see things comprehensively. Um, and there's a lot of ideas and concepts that range from Genesis all the way through Revelation. Um, and in fact, I'm teaching a class right now on the temple and we're doing that very thing. I and mean, we're looking at Genesis, the Garden of Eden, how it has a, the same structure as the tabernacle and temple as those are formed. And then, of course, themes and ideas from Genesis go all the way to Revelation 21 and 22 when it's all restored. And so I, I think it's helpful when we realize that really scripture is a story being told. It's not just a bunch of um, random statements from God and, you know, stories about people's lives that don't connect it all interconnects, and, and that's actually one of the really interesting and dynamic things about Scripture is you have the stories themselves, the immediate story, whether you mentioned Ruth or Joseph, um, but then there's also what's called meta narratives. You have kind of the grand story, and in the grand story, God's always the main character, and, and we'll see that as we you know, work through texts, whether, you know, it's Ruth's a great example. I mean, you have the story of Ruth and Naomi, but of course, how does it end? The story ends really with explaining how the plan of God is going to continue forward. And that's ultimately what, um, you know, the, the story is about in a lot of ways. And there's a whole lot of other things included in it. But um, scripture is just a beautiful story. And there's all kinds of ways things are woven together that make it interesting um, to read when you see it in that way. In the, so that's what, it, why is that important? What's good? You're trying to see the bigger picture, perhaps, if I can paraphrase. And I've read, you know, Bible survey books, which has been extremely helpful to me in understanding. Okay, real quick. Let me just remind everybody, if you can, when you come on, just please mute. If not, I'll be happy to mute you in a nice way with a smile on my face to minimize. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, please type it in the 
uh, chat session or chat box, and we'll address them that way. Um, so I, I've read Bible survey books, which has been very helpful to me as far as kind of getting the big picture. You can look so close at the bark on the trees, you need to step back and see the whole wilderness and see how things really link together. And then to me, that's when you really start to understand and appreciate these stories. You know, Isaac leads to Jacob, Jacob leads to Joseph, and then there's the book of Genesis for you. Mm -hmm. Genesis, then Joseph dies, and now you got Moses taking over in Exodus 1, a new pharaoh's in town. Uh-oh, things are going to change as far as the relationship with the Egyptian government. The first thing you have here is identifying, first you have to identify genre. Mm -hmm. And the first thing that came to mind is knowing how the Jews would break down the Old Testament. We have five classifications, you know, the law, the history, the writings, major, minor prophets, poetic wisdom, but they had only three classifications. It was the law of the prophets and then wisdom literature, the Tanakh. Mm -hmm. And so that's a little, it's same information, but just laid out differently. Does that create any problems for us sometimes as far as identifying the genre? Well, I mean, I think it's like anything else. It's kind of like our, our Bibles are broken down into chapters and verses and that can mess us up too, because we don't see the flow that's taking place within the text because, you know, we get to the end of chapter four and we stop. Um, and then maybe next week we pick up a study with chapter five and we miss those connections that are taking place. So the arrangement maybe uh, in that way, it could mess us up if, if we kind of see them classified in certain ways. And I think we should see those classifications in that way. It's, it's just a way to help us remember or um, see the connections or, or that sort of thing. Um, but really, I mean, there's, let me just draw a quick connection. I mean, we have the separation between um, the Torah and the prophets, uh, the books of history and that sort of thing, the writings. But, you know, if you don't understand Leviticus 26 and 27 and 28, uh, if you don't understand the end of Deuteronomy, then you're missing a whole lot of what's going on in the prophets. They're all connected and it's all connected to the covenant and their failure to keep the covenant and what God promised he would do if they didn't keep the covenant. And so if we haven't read Leviticus, which everyone seems to struggle to want to do, we're going to have a um, we'll understand things. It's not that you're not going to get anything out of the prophets, but the, the deeper significance of why things are happening the way they are is going to be missed on us. And so even in that way, I mean, it's a whole story that's being told and we, we got to see it kind of from beginning to end. And, and along those lines, let me, let me just reference here. Um, you know, people get very caught up in, you know, read the Bible in a year and, and depending, there's lots of different ways to approach scripture. And I think that can be a really good thing to do. Um, depending on your circumstances and what your goals are. Um, but I think if we're not careful, we kind of get into this speed reading thing, and then you miss a lot of the really dynamic, interesting things that are happening because you're just trying to get through a chapter. Um, and so if that's what we're doing, we're missing a lot. Um, so there is the need to be comprehensive, um, but there's also the need to slow down and really see what's happening in a story. Um, and, and so one of the things I would suggest is just like, you would read any story, Lord of the Rings or whatever um, story you like, the more you can see scripture in that light, the more you're going to pull out of it. Um, and the more I've seen scripture that way, the more I've actually enjoyed reading other books because I see that it, it helps you. It, it, it works your mind. And then when you open scripture, you're looking for those plot um, changes and the crises and uh, resolutions and, and uh, the whole arc of how a story works. And, and you asked, why is that important earlier? So let me talk about that quickly. Um, Shane Scott, who you had on already, um, has a, a great, I guess it's a workbook. Uh, I'm not sure the exact format, but he talks about really how to study scripture. Um, and I've used parts of that a lot, but the, the three things he mentions that are key, and I don't know, he might have got these from somebody else too, I'm not sure, but is observation, interpretation, and application. And the reason why understanding biblical narrative is important is because so often most people jump immediately to, to number three, application. They read a story and they just want to pull the quick applications out of it. And I, I'll just warn you, um, you know, those of you who are listening or look at this later, so often that's where we get bad applications or at the very least superficial applications. If we don't do the work to do the observation and the interpretation, the applications aren't going to be that great. Um, they may be fine. They may be okay. But if we really want them to be deep, things that actually speak to our lives and what we need to be doing and how we're going to please God, that's going to happen through doing a lot of good observing of texts. 
and then interpreting it, which involves, okay, what is being said to these people that are being written to right now? And then the application comes after that. So now that I know what was actually happening in this text, now how does that apply to me and to the people in my life? And that's a much deeper substantive form of application um, than just kind of pulling the quick things off the surface that is easy to do. I mean, that's low hanging fruit. Um, but if we really want to have some deep significance in our Bible reading, it's going to come through things like this. And this is not the only way to look at scripture, but I think it is an important way to understand that there's a whole story that's going on here from beginning to end and then see the stories within the story, you know, so that'd be Ruth or Joseph or the gospels um, realizing there's all these stories that are found within the big story of scripture. I don't think you'll disagree with this, but let me just point it out because you said this is not the only way, but I agree. There's a lot, to me, it's exposition, illustration, application. Maybe I need to read, read Shane Scott's, that's a good way. So exposition, what is the text saying? Let's expose it for what it's saying. And number two, illustrate how the principle works. And then number three, application. Sadly, a lot of sermons don't have a lot of application that leaves you hanging. That's a great information. What do I do with it? We have to be careful with that. But you know, here's something I heard from Barry Kircherville that I've taken with me. When you study the New Testament epistles, think about them as love letters. So when Katie was writing love letters, the first thing you did was read it as fast as you can. You didn't read the first sentence and break out a dictionary and say, okay, what's the root word of dear Brent? Um, you read it as fast as you could, then you read it again, and you're looking for things that are there, not there. And to me, that's always been a helpful way to discuss the New Testament epistles anyway, Read them and take them in, but then, yeah, you're going to slow down later on like you would a love letter from your sweetheart. Um, mm -hmm. I agree with that, but yeah, Leviticus 26 through 28 is really not much of a love letter, so it's a different way to approach it. That really speaks to, I think, what you're saying here about genre and how we identify that. And in your opening comments, you talk about literature starts this way. We identify this with junk mail versus an email from Jeff Carr, which are not the same thing. You're going to identify those as differently, right? We identify this already, right? Yeah, yeah, we learned this process very quickly and easily. I mean, the, the mail thing is just an easy illustration. I mean, you, you pull things out of your mailbox. And in fact, um, businesses, they'll try to hide you know, what they're doing. Uh, AAA does this all the time to me. They're, they're, they want to sell me life insurance. And so they now they've started trying to pack it, package it in this fancy looking, you know, eight and a half by 11 uh, thing just so I'll open it, right? I mean, so what they're trying to do is overcome genre. When I pull it out and I see immediately this is just some ad for life insurance, it goes in the recycling bin. So they're trying to overcome that because they know how quickly we can identify different types of mail we're getting, right? Sure. I mean, we know as soon as we pull it out of the mailbox that it's a birthday card. And, and some of that's because of the context. We know our birthday is within a week of when we, we do this, right? So there's so many things that go into that. Um, that help in this process of, of looking at scripture. And so, yeah, genre is extremely important. Revelation is very different than Matthew. Um, it's very different than Ephesians, right? And so we, we kind of have to understand that as we're reading through these, these different books. Within yeah, scripture. for sure. The apocryphal language is different than the gospel language, for sure. Yeah. Different mm -hmm. And that really goes to point number two in your outline you sent to me ahead of time is reading method changes how we view a text. So you're right, when you read a New Testament epistle, it's going to be different than how you read the tabernacle in Leviticus 26. Or, but, but that to me, what came to mind there was context and having to know the context. And mm -hmm. hopefully this is one of the early things we learn as Bible students is basic who's writing, who are they writing to, what are they saying. Um, but let's speak about how that's important and the methods that we go through there, if you don't mind. Yeah, um, you know, the, the way we approach a book, I think, makes a big difference. And I really like reading a book on its own terms first. I mean, you kind of talked about that with the letter, right? You, you get a letter from somebody, you read through it quickly. When you go back through it, what are you doing? I mean, when you're reading that content, you know, you know, it's a love letter or it's an informational letter. It's a, you know, holiday update. Here's what's been going on in our life. The last year letter. I mean, you, you figure those things out. Then you go back through and then you start asking questions. Well, I wonder what happened here. And now you're looking for the context as you dig through. Why is she saying this? to me? Is it about the date we had two weeks ago? And so now you're, you're trying to pull in different information. And really, and that's, that's the second step from what I mentioned earlier. Now you're interpreting that document, whatever it is. Um, and, and the great thing about story, you know, since we're focusing on story, is it, it doesn't necessarily just give you all the answers. It expresses the, the, the complexity of life in a way that um, really makes you think. We like to just have answers. 
we like to have those black and white answers. This is right and that's wrong. And it's just so easy. And, you know, Jesus told stories all the time to answer people's questions because it makes you think. And I, I love the, the story in Luke 10, well, the two stories in Luke 10, the Good Samaritan. And then right after that, you have uh, Mary and Martha, two very well-known stories. Uh, it, was, it was interesting. I don't know, years ago now, I preached on that text and, uh, you know, <laughs> pulling out the meaning and looking at it narratively. It's interesting what happens when you do that. Mark Roberts, I, I, I looked up, I used to listen to his sermons a lot on podcasts and it was just the craziest thing. I, I just preached this sermon. And then a, a few weeks later, it might've been the same week. I mean, he, the sermon he preached was almost identical. And I, there's, we didn't talk. He didn't hear my sermon. I didn't hear his, but it's just interesting when you do the work of observation and you pull it out, we made a lot of the same points, you know, in the good Samaritan, you read to that story. He's, he's really answering the question, who is my neighbor? And, you know, you have these religious people, the Levite and the priest, and of course, they're heading to the temple and they're busy in their spiritual work and all of that. Um, and the Samaritan stops and serves. Well, you go to the very next story and what's Martha criticized for? She's criticized for serving. She's distracted by much service. And, and Mary sits at the feet of Jesus and is, is occupying herself with spiritual things. So which one is it? I mean, do, do we focus on the spiritual thing, you know, service in the temple, or do we focus on serving um, our fellow man? It, you can see that the natural, good stories have contrast. Right. Good stories, they force you to think. And, and that's what we have here in how Luke is structuring even these different sections of text that he puts together. The answer is not always easy. You have to think in that situation, okay, what is best? Not is it good? It was good for Martha to serve people, but what was best for her to do? Right. Um, and see how that's a deeper application in our life when we have to think about not is it good or bad? Well, that's, that's pretty simple. I mean, murdering somebody's bad, stealing from somebody's bad. Um, but a lot of our choices in life are just like these. Is it what's good or what's better? And we have to make that choice about what's better. And that's what Martha is struggling with in this text. Um, and so it forces us to think deeper when we kind of see the connection between these stories and we read them like a narrative. To illustrate that point, when I became a Christian, first time, early 20s, first time reading the Bible, what I wanted was a checklist. Here's what, tell me what I need to do. And I was so frustrated there wasn't really a checklist. I'm so glad nobody said, go read Proverbs, and that's the answer. That was not the answer. But you, you're confronted with simple principles like love your neighbor. What does that mean? you got to think about that. you got to think about the neighbor's circumstances, and then you got to think about what's, what they, their needs are and then meet those needs. And that means the gospel is not for lazy people. But you're right. That's what, and that will drive people away. I, I think by design, that's God's way of weeding out those who are serious about serving him or not. And suddenly I realized this is not going to be as easy as I thought it was going to be. But this is more meaningful. But that's what you're talking about is getting that deeper principle. And each one of us really has to put that legwork in, I believe. Mm -hmm. so you talk about reading methods, changing how we view a, a text. A couple of things you talk about is, I'm sorry, under the, the implied author concepts that help us come to grips with the text. And one is the cultural setting. One is the messianic setting. So now we're diving a little deeper into different types of settings when you mm -hmm. talk about cultural settings, that's helpful. As those of us who like to say, we're gonna book chapter verse, that's important to us. I think of a verse like Romans 16. When was the last time you greeted somebody else with a holy kiss, Brent? Um, <laughs> I think I see the answer right there, but then also the messianic implication. And what came to mind there was the types in the shadows like Hebrews 10 and verse one talks about and all the great illusions and stories in the Old Testament. Garden of Eden is a like, it's the type of heaven. Elijah, Elisha story is like a type of John the Baptist and Jesus story. Now you realize these stories have meaning and they're pointing to something greater as Hebrews 10 and verse one tell us. So I'm gonna give you a couple openings. There. I want you to take both of them. One, the cultural setting, tell us about that holy kiss. And then number two, the types and shadows or the messianic implications. Well, I think the messianic implications is, you know, pretty clear in terms of how stories, um, even New Testament stories, but certainly Old Testament stories kind of point us toward the, the progression of God's bigger story, um, which ultimately the, the pinnacle of that is Christ. Um, and I think a great illustration of that is 
in Ruth, which I already mentioned, um, you have this whole story, and at the end of the story, it ends with this genealogy, which talks about Boaz fathered Obed, Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered David. And so the story ends now talking about David, who we know is going to be this king through which Jesus is going to come. And not only that, that's actually progressing the Abrahamic promise that through your seed, all nations of the earth are going to be blessed. I mean, so we have this kind of messianic arc that's taking place throughout all of scripture. Um, and then within the New Testament, what is Peter and what are Paul and the other apostles doing as they preach? They're showing how the story of God has progressed throughout Israelite history, um, even from the beginning of time with Adam, you know, think about Romans and how Paul makes that point. So all the messianic implications of, of how the story is being told is, is really important. Uh, I think cultural issues really are, are more a matter of our understanding. You know, when we're interpreting texts, trying to come to grips with what's happening in those texts, it's very easy for us to kind of import our own cultural understandings um, upon things, and, and then we end up missing maybe what's there or misunderstanding it. Um, so, you know, like the laborers in the vineyard, I mean, we, we tend to think of that, and most people do at least, I've heard this many times, well, these are the people, you know, just later in life, they decide to follow Jesus, and, you know, Jesus is there ready to receive them later in life. Um, that's not really the point of that story. Uh, those people are out there waiting to be hired the entire time. It's not that they just show up at the last minute. Um, no, they're they're probably the weak. They're probably the ill. Um, they're the less significant of society. And yet he takes them in and he pays them the same rate that he pays everybody else. And so there's some other things going on in that story that we don't necessarily see because of our, our context. My favorite one is um, uh, uh, the parable of the, or the uh, prodigal son, excuse me. Um, some, I'm forgetting the man's name, Mark, Mark Allen Powell maybe did a study on this, and it's just really interesting the way we see things culturally. Um, he, he had a bunch of Americans read that story and retell it, and then he had a bunch of people in St. Petersburg, Russia, read the story and tell it. Um, basically, everyone in Russia mentioned the significance, and if you're listening to this, most of you, I'm assuming, are probably American you may be even shocked when I tell you what they mentioned and what Americans didn't mention. Um, and that is the famine. How much, how often have you thought about the famine as being a significant part of that story? Um, every, pretty much everybody in St. Petersburg, Russia mentioned the famine when they retold the story and how that impacted the prodigal where like 5% of the Americans mentioned the famine because when we're hungry and we don't have food, we run to McDonald's or hopefully maybe something else better, but we have quick access to whatever we need, um, at least historically in our lives. And uh, whereas St. Petersburg, Russia was surrounded, a quarter of a million people died um, because of siege of the Nazis. So they're very familiar with famine and starvation and that becomes a significant. So the story doesn't change. It's not that the story's different. It's just how culturally we may see things in a different light, and we need to be aware of that because of our own biases or maybe things we don't pick up on that may be important in the text that we're not seeing. And, and so cultural things can make a, a big difference. Um, they just really deepen in our understanding, I think, is the, is the bigger part. I think it can even be Americans doing it. In this series of 15 or 17 speakers I've had so far, Elijah has come up two different times with two different speakers, but two different angles. Mm -hmm. And Joseph has come up a couple of times as well, two different angles again. And so, you know, we talked about it and I allowed it because I thought this is not overlap. This is a different way of talking about it. And, and you and I, my degree is in history. Your degree, I think, is not in history, but something else. I'm not sure. Uh, well, my undergraduate's in finance, but my, my graduate degree is in uh, New Testament exegesis. Very good. So my, if you were to ask us the question, what does it take to be saved? We're going to come up with a very similar conclusion, but it's going to be fun to see how we get there. Mm -hmm. a finance New Testament exegesis guy versus a historical guy and see how those roads converge together. And to me, that's a lot of fun. That's, that's fascinating in Bible study. I would like to, I've almost been tempted to say, uh, I'm going to line up a series of speakers and here's the same question I'm going to ask all of you guys and see how you reason it differently. And it's not wrong because we all think differently, but that's the gospel yeah. touches everybody that way. Well, and I think culture is huge too, especially in terms of even, you know, talk about the gospel itself um, I, I think grace, I've talked about grace uh, so much in, in recent years. It's just so misunderstood in our culture. 
um, you talk about the cultural understanding of things. I mean, when they talked about grace in ancient times, it, it was seen as something completely different in a sense than how we view it today. Um, we're very influenced by Luther and Calvin, 15th century thought. And um, that's just, it's very different. The convention of grace in antiquity was really reciprocal. I mean, there's expectation that's built into it and everyone understood that. Uh, Sophocles talked about, you know, you, you, it's favor for favor, grace for grace. Someone blesses you, you, you respond to that. And so even just simple things like that, I think from a cultural perspective, um, we struggle with sometimes because of our own modern thinking. And so that becomes a really important thing when we're reading text. Right. Don't let it get in the way of us. Let's look at a comment on Zoom from Leila. Uh, she asked me to say their name that way. So Leila, don't want to disrespect. Psalm 23 is much more significant if you have some familiarity with shepherding sheep. I'd add that parable to sower as well. Now, listen, I'm a city dweller. I grew up in Los Angeles on my uh, one-eighth anchor plot in a big subdivision. No farming, no agrarian. Or Does that make it nearly impossible or just more difficult to understand a lot of these Bible agrarian uh, analogies that are given to us? Or can we understand these things? What do you think? Well, I mean, you can understand them. Um, we can understand them to, to a certain degree, but clearly we're going to have a deeper understanding. Someone who's done some shepherding in their life is going to understand David a little bit differently. And um, they're going to have a deeper understanding of how some of these things work. I think from a narrative perspective, though, um, Psalm 23, I mean, we're very familiar with it for a lot of different reasons. But um, when we're reading through the Gospels, we may miss, there's, you know, like in Mark 6, he talks about them sitting down on green grass and He's going, they're going to eat and they're going to be satisfied. And this is where it gets really dynamic and interesting. Uh, we understand the New Testament and we know phrases and concepts from the New Testament. And, and actually in, modern, in, in dominant culture, people will talk about, you know, that's a good Samaritan, right? They may not have read the Bible in five years, but they know what a good Samaritan is. And so when you think about, this is a little bit about like the ideal reader we talked about a few minutes ago, when, when I a person who knows the Old Testament is picking up Mark 6 and reading through it, and they see these references to sitting on green grass and, and God feeding them, and they're satisfied. I mean, they're going to be making connections to the Old Testament. And so it's not just the shepherd concept. It's also some of the content of the Old Testament that gets pulled forward into New Testament language and the way these writers express themselves, because that's their world. They know the Old Testament. And is when they want to express the idea of who Jesus is, when he's feeding the 5,000 or when he's feeding the 4,000, um, they're pulling concepts from the Psalms and from other parts of, of the Old Testament to tell their story and to express those ideas. And so now we've hit a couple different aspects of something like Psalm 23. Um, and I, I, it's, what, it's just like you've always heard. It's like the onion that you keep peeling back. I mean, that's what happens with, with good narrative. And when you understand that all of this is connected into how we should understand it. I uh, met Homer Haley one time before his death. I, I was in Tucson, Arizona, 97, 98 years old. And uh, I don't know how many lessons he's preached, books he's written and so forth. And the first time I met him, I walked into his office and he had four Bibles open, four different gospels and his body just about failed him. And he wanted me to sit down and just tell me something brand new he discovered in the gospels. And, I thought, and about a week later, I met a college kid on the campus of University of Arizona. He was about 19 or 20. And he told me, I've read the Bible once. I know all there is to know about the Bible. <laughs> and what a contrast there is of, you know, who's honest, who's not. But yeah, yeah, you could be that old. And that's what gives you and I something to study all the time. We can look forward to diving deeper into the Good Samaritan, Martha, Maris, Martha, Martha and Mary story, among other things. There's always going to be something you're going to miss. And you and I, and I think everybody here understands this principle. Uh, we should never have a shortage of things to talk about or share or things we get excited about because the gospel is full of them. One of the things you talk about here is the, you know, learn to appreciate structure. And you've talked about that somewhat already. The thing that came to mind is a comment I heard about this, and that, that is nothing is in the Bible by mistake. Mm. There's a reason it's there. We may not understand why it's there, but that means we have to do the legwork to figure out why it's there. To me, the book of Ruth is great. A story about Boaz and the love story and the he's chasing her and the service of Naomi and all these great things. 
and the Leverite marriage as a background, but in the end, why is there genealogy there? Well, Matthew 1 and Luke 1 talk about that genealogy and put these Moabite women in there. There's Moabite blood in the veins of the, mess, the Messiah. There's a deep lesson there as well. Um, so, yeah, nothing is there by mistake, but there is structure. There's a reason Matthew is ordered the way it is and Luke the way it is as well. You've talked about that already. Anything to add to that before we move on? Or Yeah, I, you know, structure is amazing. I, I just love the structure of these texts. Um, the, the one that comes to mind to me is, and you talk about the person who says they know everything, you know, uh, no, you don't. Yeah. <laughs> Looking through these gospels and the way, that, I mean, Matthew 1 itself, incredible structure, even in the genealogy. I have an article I wrote a long time ago about the importance of genealogies in Matthew 1. I mean, it's just amazing the stuff that is in, just embedded within that genealogy. But, it, you know, Mark 6 through 8, there's this whole section in which the two feeding stories actually are about you know, God, God coming to Israel, but then also God coming to the Gentiles. And it's wrapped up in the way the story is told. Um, and right there in the middle in chapter seven is the Syrophoenician woman, the Greek woman who is healed. And there, there's more dynamics than we can get into right now. But I mean, it's, it's amazing the way it's told and the way Mark does it. Um, and I think there's an elegance in the stories as you look at them a little deeper. Yeah. You look at it this way, there's an elegance, and it does help you appreciate. It doesn't help you memorize book, chapter, verse. That's a different, different concern altogether, but it does help you remember the story and the illustration of the story and the application of the story. That's, I think that's the benefit of this understanding biblical narrative stuff is mm -hmm. understanding how the elegance of the story weaves in and out. And you remember the key characters. You remember the location. You don't know, remember the date. Okay, October 2nd, 445 BC, Nehemiah rebuilt the walls. I don't win you money on Jeopardy, but really, that's not what it's about, is it? No, and, and I think if we understand how to read story, it highlights the things that really matter. And and that's where I think this really is important. I mean, like in, in the Joseph story, there's all kinds of things going on there. And in fact, as I was reading through this a few days ago, some new things popped out to me that, that might be going on there. But I mean, you're seeing kind of the exposition, the beginning of the story, the, the, where they live, and Joseph is favored by his father, and he's got this position of authority where he's bringing a report about his brothers, uh, which then brings conflict, and then, then the rising action, right? This is all story elements. That's the arc of the story. They're upset. They sell him into slavery. Now there's a crisis, but he finds himself ruling in Potiphar's house, second in command. Oh man, things seem great. Every story contains, every good story contains all of these elements. Every movie you watch, every TV show you watch, they contain all of these elements and that's why you like them. And so things seem good, right? I mean, this is the kind of um, what some call the fun and game section, right? I mean, he's in control, he was in slavery and it was bad, but now he's got a great position and then Potiphar's wife shows up and it all falls apart and now he's in prison again and then you know he comes out of that now he's second in command to pharaoh and again things seem great then his brothers show up you know it's just the up and down of the story and then the final resolution when when his family comes i mean that's the art of how a story is done and it's all over the place in scripture but even in that story if you remember at the end god is still the main character because when his brothers are concerned that now that their father's dead, Joseph's going to get his revenge, he says, no, I mean, don't you know this was God's doing? This is God working to progress his plan. Um, and so that, that just makes scripture even more beautiful and dynamic when you see all the underlying elements that, that are going on, even in those single stories as they develop. This is possible. It makes a great story. I mean, that's why the Star Wars movies are popular. These genres keep popping up and, I watched the newer episodes, so it sounds like a lot of the older episodes just recast himself. You know, Obi-Wan dies or it's Harrison Ford dying is, you know, whatever. The, the, the repeat access of it, but it's to a new audience. My kids are seeing this for the first time and getting excited about it when I saw the first ones when I was their age. Anyway, let's go, I put my Ruth notes down, by the way. You sent me those, but because uh, let's go to Joseph. I think let's talk about that. Story. Okay. We talked about it some, but let's use that as sort of a test case here about some of the gen the the uh, generalities here, the things that pop out. The, again, I call it the elegance of the story. You've mentioned some of the similar or the same of the same, same ideas that keep popping up. You know, one to me, a couple things. One, Joseph is given a coat of distinction, mm -hmm. and then it's used to deceive. You know, here, Dad, your your son Joseph's dead. Actually, we sold him into slavery. We're not going to tell you that. 
But then he's also given a coat in Potiphar's house, and then that's used to deceive. Remember, Potiphar's wife ripped it off of him. But then the third time, he's given a coat of distinction to serve as prime minister. So this, and then the, the deception ends, which is great. But then also, you've got this pit. The Hebrew word there is bor, B-O-R. Mm-hmm. And so Genesis 39, he's thrown into a pit. And then uh, caravaners come and take him to Egypt. But then Potiphar's wife, he's thrown again into a pit, B-O-R, dungeon. Uh, third time around, he's not thrown into a pit. He's thrown in, uh, into a item. So these things, to me, the elegance of the story that repeats itself helps to drive that home. And you think, boy, there, it's obvious that God wrote this. When you start looking yeah. at these types of patterns and how, how old was Joseph? I mean, he, all these years of Joseph's life, it was, you know, seven, 14 years later when the son, brothers came back. We don't recognize this guy, but he recognized them right away. Yeah. But this is over spirit. The spirits behind this obvious is my conclusion here. Well, and, and you have that whole, those are called type scenes. You know, there, there's elements of that that fit what's called a type scene. The, the one that most of the listeners are familiar with is the woman at the well. Um, you keep having that pop up in stories all throughout scripture, but that's an example of a type scene. It's going to contain certain elements. Um, another one uh, in, in our culture, um, you know, the, the bad guys wear black, right? That's kind of a an element of all stories. And a lot of times, and, it, and this changes over time, but you, you know, you know who the bad people are because they're dressed a certain way when they show up in the story, right? Um, you mentioned all the garments. You know, it's interesting because that it really, you know, he's deceived by Laban with Leah, you know, and she's covered in garments. Um, Rachel deceives her father uh, in a sense with her garments and, you know, covering things up. It, it just, it keeps popping up everywhere. And then, in fact, there's another element of the story um, with Judah. You know, Judah is. Um, kind of taken advantage of because of his garments, his possessions with Tamar, how she deceives him. And this is, of course, a contrast to Joseph and Potiphar's wife. Um, and really, the, the story itself, when you work your way back, is in some senses Judah versus Joseph. Um, Reuben and Simeon have kind of removed themselves from the picture because of some of their actions. And so now Judah stands to have the most advantage and he wants to get rid of Joseph. Uh, he, he gets rid of him. He gets him out of the picture because he's the favored child, but um, Reuben and Simeon, they're out of the picture. He's now going to get the double portion. And now what you have at the end of the story, the, the very next thing you see is that contrast. Judah, he's just a wicked guy. I mean, he's, he's sleeping around with different people, even his own daughter-in-law who he hasn't given to his son and he doesn't know it because she's covered like a prostitute. So there's that deception again. Um, and he's, then he, he's ready to just cast her off just like he did Joseph. And the very next story is Joseph saying no to Potiphar's wife. Um, you know, so now we're doing characterization. We're, we're seeing the difference between these characters at the end of the story though, you see this transformation taking place with Judah. So the story is not just about Joseph. It's also about Judah at the end of the story when Joseph sets them up and the the cup is found in Benjamin's bag. um, Judah now steps in to deliver, to restore, right? And so we see this progress. I mean, the other brothers, you know, Reuben and Simeon, hopefully they transform too. They're kind of bubbling idiots. I mean, they, they say dumb things and, and Judah for all his wickedness, at least he's practical. And he tells his father, you know, I'm going to take care of it. Just let me take care of it. And then he does in the end, he's been transformed again. Another part of it, any good story transformation, mm-hmm. Judah's transformed. Joseph is transformed. And so we see the beauty of the arc of this story as Judah is this horrible guy that we, we learn about, but at least by the end, Joseph sees that he steps in for his little brother. And he's willing to give himself. And there's a, uh, there's a salvation history aspect to that too, I think. I don't know how deep to go into that, but Judah is now delivering. Um, and of course, Jesus from the seed of Judah is going to deliver his people. So um, I don't know if I can make that connection. That, that, that's interesting to me. But you, you start to see these amazing things come out of these stories and like you said, they're just all over the place in, in the word thing. And especially in Hebrew, there's all kinds of wordplay and, and connections with how things are phrased. And let's remember, too, these books were not all written at the same time. This is 66 books by 40 authors over 1,500 years. And 
mm-hmm. to me, it just solidifies, slams door, the, shut the door that this is from God here. Who else could this be from? And so we're not just one author sitting down and putting this great story together. This is over a period of time, these things came out and the Old Testament is finished by what, 425, 450 BC, then 400 something years later, then the New Testament comes along and mm-hmm. these people are not talking to each other, coming up with the same story. There's some, there is a same source they're going to. And to me, that underscores the significance of a lot of these great stories here. As a side note, you know, I've heard this, tell me if you've heard this as well, the multicolored uh, tunic a coat that Jacob gave his youngest favorite son, Joseph, where did he get that from? Maybe he got it from Laban and those specially spotted lambs he was trying to sneak out of the camp. And, and if that's true, I don't know who knows if that's true or not, but if that's true, uh, it just kind of adds another layer to the deception of these guys are deceiving each other and then it just connects even further. And it just, it's, it's all connected there. To me, that's icing on the cake to what you were talking about, the, the garments of, it goes deeper than this is the garments of Joseph. It goes back before. Yeah. That even, so. mm-hmm. Anyway, very good. Um, I don't know where else to go from here. One thing that came to mind was, as you're talking about the, the themes in the scripture, um, think about how Satan tempted Adam and Eve. To me, it's lust of the flesh, lust of the pride, the boastful pride of life, and how they failed. But then Satan tempts Jesus the exact same way in Matthew 4, lust of the pride, lust of the flesh, boastful pride of life, and how he defended that. And to me, when you study that type of simple, to me, simple narrative, easy to connect that with First John 2, how Satan works, one group failed, one succeeded. Now you understand your enemy a lot better, and if you have that knowledge, you're better equipped to kind of go through life. Um, Is that the way you see it? Then we'll get to Jesse's question on Zoom here in just a moment. Yeah. Um, So there's that. I I think, you know, one of the interesting things about Jesus is he's, he's kind of a a retelling of the story of Israel. And so where Israel failed, he succeeds. Um, And I think that's a big part of that wilderness. You know, you look at the elements of the wilderness wandering and the temptations, um, you know, Israel has all of that. And of course they fail. Um, he's, he's brought out into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights and you know, they wander in the wilderness for 40 years. There's all kinds of, of terminology that matches these two stories together. When he responds to Satan, he's quoting sections of Deuteronomy that relate to their wilderness wandering. And so I think a lot of what's going on there in a, in a deeper narrative understanding is he is, uh, Israel is being reinterpreted through the life of Jesus. And actually, um, in the Gospel of Matthew, I think that's happening through the entire book. Um, you, you have these different sections of Matthew where really the history of Israel is being told all the way through. Um, and so you have like the parable section, for instance, and Solomon is mentioned there, the wisdom of Solomon. And so that's kind of the period of um, you know, Solomon's wisdom in the Old Testament. And now Jesus is greater than that. So I, I think, you, again, you have some deeper things going on there. Um, that connect to the Old Testament stories. And we know this about Jesus. Israel failed. I mean, I think that's what's going on in Isaiah. They're supposed to be a light to the nations and they're not. They fail at this. And that's why you need the suffering servant um, who can be embodied by numerous people in the way they act. Um, I think even including Joseph, you could look back at how Joseph does what he does and he fits that motif of the suffering servant. But Jesus is the pinnacle. He is the ultimate um, servant of God who delivers his people. And so the failures in the wilderness are now being reversed. That's one way to think about it. Um, and of course you have a good bit of that with lots of other things too. I mean, Eden, Adam and Eve sin, uh, they're driven out of the garden. What happens in revelation? Now you have access to the tree of life again. So we see these reversals taking place. And so that's kind of what I mean about the importance of story and narrative. How we, we see those connections happening. I think it drives a point. I mean, you're right. What was lost in Eden was gained in the end of Revelation chapter 22 there. And uh, that's bookend to bookend, really. That sums it all up, basically. But, and, and, and probably people have heard this before, but it's worth saying again. I mean, the, Genesis 1, 2, and 3 um, really tell us why we need the rest of Scripture. You have the fall of man in chapter 3. Everything else after that is about getting back to Eden. It's about restoring Eden. And so, again, that's, that's the story. One, two, and three is the exposition. It's the beginning. It's how the story starts. And then the rest of it is about getting back to God. And that's why you end up where you do in Revelation. I might even argue the first 11 chapters of Genesis with the Tower of Babel and the flood and everything else. They're just trying to do life on their own without God. They, just, they fail miserably. 
And yeah. in chapter 12, the promise of Abraham comes on, and there we go. And that kind of starts the ball rolling the other direction there. So. Well, in that, that's right. There's, there's creation and there's uncreation. It's like God's he's, – he's trying multiple times to get people to see what he wants them to do. And it doesn't look very good. You know, right. um, he brings Noah off the, the, the ship, and what happens? He sins in the garden. Mm-hmm. He plants a vineyard. He gets drunk. You know, there's sin happening in the garden again. See how the stories keep being right. told? Um, yeah. And they're repeating, you know, and so, yeah, you're exactly right. It's that, that sin story is kind of repeated there earlier in Genesis. And then again, the rest of the books about restoring that. Very good. Okay. Let's look at a question from Jesse and then we'll wrap it up here. He says, quote, could you touch on how understanding the biblical narratives affect our need and our ability to study inductively versus deductively? Do you see a connection there? Okay, Brent, and tell us why you're wearing black after what you said about black, too. So. <laughs> it's actually blue, but it's I understand, to... yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesse also says, I also think it's important to point out how the layered nature and deep connections of the stories from front to back are strong internal evidence for the truth of the Bible. Exactly. That's kind of repeated. So take yeah. that first question that Jesse talked about there. Yeah, so that second comment kind of fits what you were saying a few minutes ago, Jeff. Um, I think that's definitely true. Um, when, when you start digging deeper and deeper and deeper, it's it's hard to uh, deny the authority of what's coming out of that. And um, so I think that's a great observation. Inductive versus deductive. I mean, there's value in both uh, depending on what you're doing, you know, um, but inductive, essentially induct induction is observation. So it's, you know, it's the first part of the, um, I'm going to use a big word, hermeneutical process. That's just the idea of interpretation, but it, it all, um, it's all connected. And so as you're reading, you're observing what's happening in the text and, and it's helping you come to terms with, with what's going on. Um, so uh, let me give you um, what I think is maybe somewhat of a controversial <laughs> illustration. And so people can disagree with me if they want. Um, but, you know, when Moses um, is told to bring water out of the rock to, um, for, for the Israelites. Uh, a lot of times we focus on the fact that he struck the rock. Um, but from a narrative perspective, and especially if you're talking about induction, which is what Jesse brings up, uh, I, I think I have a hard time with that interpretation. Number one, because the Psalms say his problem was he spoke rashly. Um, that's what we're in scripture what we're told about Moses is that he spoke rashly. That's how he sinned. Um, we're not told that he sinned by striking the rock. And that's a, that's an implication we draw out of it. Usually for authority, we're trying to make a point about authority or something. Um, but actually, if you read through the story of Moses, when he's told to take the rod, he's striking things with it. Uh, and in the story, he is told to take his rod and, uh, and go and bring water out of the rock. And so this is again, where I think this narrative concept is important because you trace what's happening with Moses and how he's using his rod and what he's doing. And then God says, take your rod and go speak to the rock. Um, Unless God's just trying to trick him or something or fool him here, which I don't think God would do. um, It seems odd to me that we make that the big issue. And, and that comes from observation. If we're observing how things are happening in the text. Now, let me say there's going to be people who disagree with that. And there's some arguments in both direction. But I think that's just an illustration of why observation is important instead of deduction sometimes. From deduction, we say, well, he has to be told to strike the rock and he's not told to strike the rock. And usually, this is an example of where we take a text and we try to use it for our purposes. We're trying to make a point about authority by using that text um, rather than just observing the story from beginning to end. You know, he's, he's hitting things. He's using his rod to separate the sea and to do all, you know, um, he struck the rock the first time when, when he was bringing water out of it. So is God now like through semantics trying to trick Moses and see if he'll listen carefully enough um, I don't know. I, I'm not sure that's really what, what God's going after here. I, I think the problem was he didn't sanctify God by his language. He said, did, did Aaron and I have to bring this water out of the rock for you? And he's getting a little bit too big for his britches, we would say. And um, that seems to be the issue. 
Um, and, you know, if someone wants to say he sinned by striking the rock, I'm not going to argue with him too much, but I think through inductive, um, lo- looking through scripture, through observation, I, I think there's some things to think about in that way. And this helps us too, because when we're thinking about what pleases God, um, we, we've got to look and observe the sorts of things that are happening in scripture and see how they guide us toward making the right choices. Because remember Mary and Martha and the Good Samaritan, it's not always just a, a simple decision. We're trying to take all the information and make the best choice we can make. And that can be pretty complex. I think um, we're all experiencing a little bit of that right now, trying to do the best we can and make the best choices we can in the situation we're in. Am I right? I mean, I think it's a, a tough situation for a lot of us at the moment. I'm going to answer. Jesse says exactly. He gives his own version of an amen. He says exactly. That's often gets us into problems. And then Jesse goes on to talk about the danger of bringing too many assumptions when we want deductive reasoning to force what we want. And yeah, that's, that's being honest or not honest. And that's what every Bible student should ask themselves. Are you projecting onto the scripture? Are you letting the scripture project onto you? Or are you allowing God to force you into his image? Are you trying to make God into your own image here? I think it comes down to that much here. So, And that's about coming to the text with humility, number one, and with openness um, and, and a willingness to dialogue. You know, I, I may have my ideas about whatever, about Moses striking the rock or whatever the the situation is. And I may talk to you and you may show me some things I hadn't thought about that now I, I, that now comes into how I interpret that text. And so that involves humility. It it involves openness, again, to let the text guide things rather than my preconceived notions um, forcing me into certain interpretations. And so I think we have to be open to that idea. I think rule number one when uh, studying the Bible, talking with others, trying to learn more is assume you could be wrong. I think that's always a good start. (laughs) Ask the questions, okay, but assume you could be wrong and just go for broke and see what happens if you are uh, open to that. So very good. Okay, guys, wrap it up here. Any, uh, Any concluding thoughts you have, Brent? I just want to thank you for bringing us a nice discussion on understanding biblical, uh, narrative and it really is a help to me an aid to study the bible more it's an encouragement to study but also here are some tools on how to study the bible for those who might say i don't know what to do i don't know how to approach this and we talked about to me the takeaway for me those three things the uh, i'm going to paraphrase wrong observation and then you you say it because i have it differently observation interpretation and then application thank you Um, i have exposition illustration application but similar ideas there and I would suggest if you're interested in more of this, there's some sources you can look at. Probably the easiest one to get started is a, a book called Mark as Story by David Rhodes. And he just does a great job of, uh, you know, typical disclaimers about any book. There's going to be things that I may not agree with, but um, overall, I mean, it's just so great about in the Gospels, especially um, how to look through those stories. And just real quickly, if we have another one, 30 more seconds. I would suggest um, a great example of how we could do this well or do it better. And and I hope I don't offend anybody with this, but um, it's just, we need to get out of all these harmonization of the gospel studies and we need to get into reading gospels from beginning to end and understand each gospel on its own terms. And then when we've done that really, really well, I mean, when we know Matthew for Matthew and Mark for Mark and Luke for Luke and John for John, then we can go to the next step, which is maybe harmonizing some things. But we really do ourselves a disservice when um, we're trying to harmonize all this stuff. And they're telling the story the way they tell it for a reason, not so that it matches the other gospels or that sort of thing. Um, There's thematic reasons why John places the temple cleansing in chapter two instead of at the end of the story. I mean, there's there's reasons why they're doing what they're doing. And it's not about chronology most of the time. It's not about trying to line up with what the other gospels say. That's actually the great thing about it. They're not really trying to do that and they still harmonize. I mean, but we'll do ourselves a really good service in our Bible study. If we'll pick up Matthew and read it to beginning to end and realize all these stories are lined up in just the right way to tell the story Matthew wants to tell. And so that's my encouragement. Uh, Good, uh, good concluding thoughts. Yeah. When you study, I studied Luke recently, study Luke for Luke by itself. Let's not go outside of Luke. The original audience did not get that either. So uh, they just read Luke for what it is. Leila says, I would agree. Say if you read the Bible books, the way you read a book for entertainment, you will likely get a lot more out of it. So very good comment. Conclude this. Very good. Okay, Brent. Hey, I want to say thank you, Brent. I'm going to 
uh, end the recording and then stay on the line, please, Brent. Let's talk a little bit after and send me to do that. But uh, say goodbye to your audience here, Brent. We got well, I appreciate everybody coming to listen. Uh, thanks for having me on, Jeff. Absolutely. Thank you. So many stuff recording here.